me as well personally early on right like if a game should be offered me a role when i was like trying to get in and they would have told me that hey you have to go to some xyz corner of the world uh, you know <laughs> i mean <didn't>. like, <laughs> okay do it right <laughs> so yeah they didn't even finish like oh but there's a catch like you son of a bitch i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly who gives a fuck right <laughs> so, uh but yeah awesome so, so since then you moved to uh, you know bangalore pretty much i think you've been in bangalore throughout right like you haven't really lived mostly. in other parts of the country right mostly but no i actually between my first start up moonfrog and starting bombay play i was in hyderabad for a year hmm. uh the as um design director of the uh, the glue mobile studio okay over hmm. there hmm. which was is a whole other story but uh It was a, a story in which I had to work on a game called uh, Quiz Up, which was like super famous back in the day, and it was being run by this team in Iceland. And they kind of flew me into Iceland, and I had to like rescue the game. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and th- yeah, it was like the biggest, uh, the, like the ultimate cash burning startup you've ever seen. So, <laughs> whatever you can think of, they were doing it. They had this like. boardroom table which was like handcrafted and had the quiz up logo in the middle and then they had two chefs which were like three star michelin chefs working in their kitchen <laughs> do everything I, to delight the team but not the customers <laughs> yeah yeah like <laughs> honestly um uh, and the game wasn't making any money and uh, i think glue mobile had had forced them really to like put ads in the game to try and monetize somehow mm. um yeah but uh but the yeah, target just, demographic was for like indian demographic or like global audience no 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 it was a, that was a global audience although it has a lot of it was localized so it was, you know mm. i think we had a, a big very surprising audience actually like during the month of ramzan it was like very popular in france for some reason it it was like a tradition over there to play quiz up Okay, interesting. Like Ramadan and France, right? Like they yeah, yeah. I didn't ever think of it's the first those. time I've ever seen it. But it was like a huge spike in in the AUs that we saw in that time. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, what kind of got you started with the uh, you know uh, even Bombay play, right? Like how did that thesis evolve? How did you guys come up uh, with the hypothesis to build the studio? Um, I think so. Just some context, like Moonfrog, my first startup was making games for India, so we didn't. you know lo- games of local flavor like um pimpati ludo the bahu bali game the aliabat game um and i i i think um i find that strategy quite i i find myself quite unsatisfied by that hmm. um i always wanted to be i always believed that the gaming scene in india had the talent all you needed to do was bring it together and and set a big vision and it could achieve sort of building world class you know quality games that could scale um so that was really the vision of bombay play um, and and really taking everything we learned throughout our journey you know as a good blue moon frog and mm-hmm. taking all the all the learning from all of those mistakes got it but was the idea around like okay that we're going to cater to xyz type of an audience this is going to be the persona based on their learning so far or these are the kind of games that we are going after um, were there like those kind of strategies thought through in terms of the inception of the studio itself or did that came around much much oh later? yes we had it all worked out <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, perfect, yeah, yeah. perfect start up right <laughs> yeah yeah no, actually uh, our philosophy was more like we just need to be in the market and we have to be building and the opportunities have to find us at our desks working mm-hmm. so even though we didn't have such a clear idea of how we were going to which game exactly and uh, how we were going to focus we had faith that our you know as founders of our, our core team would figure it out mm-hmm. and so long as we listened to or like paid attention to trends and kept and you know struck at the right time we would succeed i think uh, it's a mistake to remain too focused on just wanting to do one thing yeah yeah um you kind of miss out on the, all the other opportunities um and if you focus for too long 
um, then you, yeah, it's uh, it, too. But if you, if you're too stubborn, in other words, correct. But like yeah. sometimes there is the the reverse wisdom as well, and I'm just being like the devil's advocate here, right? Sure. Like, um, you might get too distracted as well, and blockchain gaming is a perfect example, right? <laughs> <laughs> Where almost every studio that at least I know of, right? would have pinged us at some point or the other thinking about Web3 talent, right? Senior folks in the Web3 space, junior folks in the Web3 space, whatever you might have it, right? So, um, you know, at, at some point as part of the leadership team, right, you have to filter, and especially as CEOs, you have to filter the noise from the signal, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To figure out what is worth distracting the team uh, with and what to, you know, uh, flush out and keep on the sidelines, right? So let, that's not- That's distracting. so true. Like, you know, engineering time, design time is so precious. Like yeah. everyone, everyone on your team only has so much time in the day to do something. And that time costs you money mm -hmm. as a business. So really thinking of it under the lens of um, how much will this cost me really gets you to focus. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I would want to spend that money on the things that are making me money uh, yeah. versus the versus the pie in the sky ideas. But that's also a trap. Yeah. Um, and I'll give you an example, like uh, like Moonfrog, when we we focus too much, I would say, on maintaining our team party game. Mm. Uh, like it was like a, at one point, I think it was 70 or 80 percent of the studio, maybe just focusing on this one game. But that game had reached its maximum. Like there was no growth happening. And uh, so you only had this small portion, like the, the other 20% doing the things that could give, that could double your revenue. Yeah. Whereas everyone else is just working on maximizing or, or sort of uh, trying to get closer to the local maximum of mm -hmm. the existing work like product. So I think that experience sort of changed my thinking about it. Like. To, to rather reverse or flip that whole model on its head mm. in a gaming studio if you want to be an innovation center you should have 20 percent of the people maintaining your cash cow and the other 80 percent finding out well trying to find these 2x 3x opportunities mm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So I would have imagined that the wisdom is reverse, right? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's uh, common wisdom. But yeah, we, uh, I think we're all. Uh, I think uh, it depends from company to company. Like, yeah. Some some people will say the worst thing you could possibly do is you know uh, move your focus away from your cash cow. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That like not doubling down on the things that are working and trying to move to things that are not yet working, right? That's still yeah. experimental. Sure, if they work, you could skyrocket to the moon, but then um, those are bets <laughs> that only pay off one in a hundred, right? So mm -hmm. so you got a way of the odds, right? So, I, so like similar thing, right? Like uh, while you were at, I think, Moonfrog, I was with Jungly Capes, right? And for two, one, two years that I spent with Jungly, Initially, I was hired in India as a first sort of game focused engineer. The rest of the entire team was just focusing on Rummy and Deen um, Pati, right? And, and I was brought in to actually start building the India focused team uh, okay. back in 2014 uh, to build a more distributed global IP that is not dependent on casino as a genre. Right, and and we failed really hard uh, <laughs> just because we couldn't find good talent. We ended up building a completely remote distributed team, ex Blizzard engineers and whatnot shit. Right, um, just because coming from Bay Area, working with companies there, that the bar for quality was so high that mm -hmm. we just couldn't find the right fit here in India. Right, and and you know, but again, like in our th philosophy, the thesis was reversed, right? 80% of the team was still focused on uh, maintaining Rummy and growing Rummy, which was the cash cow, the real money Rummy, right? And, yeah. and, and the game was doing phenomenal. But I think the only difference there was that in the Moonfrog example that you gave, the game was not growing, right? The user base was not scaling. For us, exactly. Rummy was still growing. And our mobile team was like only seven people at that time. I think mm -hmm. I was like the second person, the other person was in Hong Kong and, you know, uh, we're trying to build this team out here. Um, and in, at peak, we reached like 12 or 13 people. We still pumped out a very awesome hundred people, MMO, uh, you know, uh, but, but it was definitely fight against the Jungle trend. launched an MMO, what? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was called oh, EP.io, and I was the okay. uh, uh, initial engineer who was starting to work on it on the first on the client side. And is it still live? It might be. I'll have to check. Uh, but this is like Did a 2015 take, project. Take okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's called uh, EatMe.io. You guys can check. So it was Re- kind of revive it, put it on the blockchain. <laughs> on the blockchain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you remember, there was like a fad in between called Agario that came up yeah. from somewhere yeah. here in China. The blobs or, that consume. The blobs the that blobs, consume. Yeah. So the core mechanic was the same, but we had given it a very nice underwater theme and whatnot, stuff, right? And made it work real yeah. time on clients. So, so probably one of the best games that I'm most proud of. In terms just of just imagine if each one of those blobs was a DAO. Think about it. <laughs> and the more DAOs consuming other DAOs, gamified <laughs> DAO consumption. Yeah, yeah. yeah one yeah. in finance. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> one is a DeFi DAO, one is a GameFi DAO, one is what not <laughs> shit, right? Like just throwing all the possible jargons in there to confuse the fuck out of your player base, no matter what. <laughs> and just put in a Dogecoin behind everything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But anyways, cool, awesome. So, uh, you know, like the topic for the conversation today was like USPs, right? Unique selling propositions for um, DAO for DAOs. <laughs> so, uh, sure. was for games, right? So, what do you think, right? Are there USPs? Because typically, this is an area where game companies differ from the broader tech ecosystem, right? So, how do you think about USPs and customer personas and all that stuff that is highly, highly important for a tech startup. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess when I was given this topic of USPs, uh, I was thinking about personal USPs, which is also important. Mm. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. That's a different perspective, but yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, I think um, I, what I find is that some to, people approach problems from different uh, perspective. Some some people who maybe are not so experienced in gaming typically find experiences uh, or, or find like market opportunities that are quite valid, but mm-hmm. they can't execute on them because they're not looking at their own personal USPs, mm-hmm. right? Um, like at, I'm sure at some point making MMO or making an open world was a was a popular trend, mm-hmm. but how well are you placed to execute on that? Yeah. Um, and I've seen that with uh, some companies, like a lot of companies fail because of this reason. They think they can just come up with an idea and find the people to do it. Um, instead of considering like, what is the talent kind of available? Yeah. And what are people good at already? So mm-hmm. looking at like the Bangalore ecosystem, it's a lot of free to play specialists. Mm-hmm. Um, and some, I think a, a good community of sort of people who've worked in RNG. Mm-hmm. So if yeah. you wanted to do something more, cas- maybe casual casino, Bangalore might be not a bad place to pull that off or to hire for them. But to pull off an MMO, hmm. you know, maybe you should go to an, <laughs> or, yeah. or, unless you're in it for the long haul and you're willing to put in those years to train, to iterate and get it right. I mean, I'm not saying you should not. It's just what your horizon is, I guess. Hmm. Right. So right. you can you can work on your USPs and you know work you know work three x as hard to make sure that you you know have the knowledge in order to pull this thing off, hmm. um, or you can kind of play to your strengths and figure out what the unique combination of uh, sort of ideas and your strengths are hmm. to create a like a working, a workable business model. So when you say your strengths, right? Like who, who are you referring to, right? Like, are you thinking of like the founders itself or the project creators? Because at some point or the other, if it's a large ambitious project or even a potential studio, right? Like you would need other people as well, right? So, so there are factors like talent density like you pointed out, right? Like whether that talent exists, right? So I'll come back to the talent density part because obviously with COVID thrown in, there is a very different uh, ecosystem now that you could tap into, which earlier was not that at least flexible. But but then just from a founder slash indie creator or, or the person who originates a project, right? Like, are you talking about from purely from that perspective? Yeah, like I think Bombay Play with over 50 people today um, but for the first year, it was just three of us working away. I strongly b- believe that the founding team of a gaming company should be able to pull off the vision, 
even if they don't hire a single other person. It may take them a lot more time, but they yeah. should have the knowledge to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so then you definitely would probably not have a, a solo founders in Ariway, right? It'll, oh, so, it'll be sorry, definitely. Sorry, yeah, sorry, man. Guys. Sorry, man. No, was, well, <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the gaming business, you could be a solo founder and yeah. you could have all of the prerequisite abilities to mm-hmm. uh, launch a successful game. And that has been done. So I wouldn't say solo founder isn't the way to go. It's just, uh, you know, they've been highly successful games built by an individual. Mm. Um, but usually those will be like, I think then being more realistic about the scale of the project would also be an uh, important factor, right? Like there have been yeah. very successful indie projects that are solo created. Some have slogged at it for 10 years and yeah. others have pumped it out in a, in a year or so. But then I think the scale drastically changes as well as to what you can achieve uh, and whether you have all the skill sets of an art artist or designer um, music etc yeah so yeah. some 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 bastards are that talented to be honest but <laughs> most of us maybe not um yeah. but yeah so i am thinking about like what your founding team no matter how ambitious your project is you should have all the skills available mm-hmm. if you're starting off with a whole of that size like oh we're a founding team with no no cto then mm. you're like as your business evolves you'll always have that gap mm, got it but then right. if folks who are thinking of starting and they have no cto right what's what's your uh, suggestion to those right because they are good, ambitious bring people, on a right? cto and give them good uh no, good freaking hard man like have you, have you ever tried to go <laughs> on an open market and find a cto right <laughs> it's just so fucking yeah. hard right it is, it is, it is, but um, and for, well, starting a business is hard and that's what needs to be done, and, like, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, yeah, like give, I think also I'm a big believer in, although I've heard some, some contrary opinions, uh, but starting off with a founding team 50-50 or equal shareholding is also the best way to go. So you're always equally as incentivized to like you know execute oh, got it my take on this is slightly different like you can right. still have a near equal split but <laughs> not have a perfect equal split right like you can still have 51 49 which is all for all intents and purposes gives everyone equal weightage in terms to weigh in make sure that they're doing their best but then mm-hmm. usually uh, sets the right tone to say okay Right, if, especially if it's a two people thing, decisions can end up in a stalemate, right? So sure. having either very good understanding to say, okay, this is my focus area, that's your focus area. I have veto rights in design, you have veto rights in engineering or whatever the case may be, right? Um, or, or this kind of an un, slight uneven split that just says, okay, <laughs> worst comes to worst, right? We just need to shove through shit and yeah. move forward with the decision, right? There is yeah. at least a clear uh, authority to say, all right, my decision is the last thing. I'll be very respectful and open about your calls, et cetera, et cetera. But then it has to be my decision no matter what. Because I could talk about, yeah, I could talk about this for a while, but I think it comes down to roles as well. And also yeah. intent. Yeah. Yeah. Like if, if you split something 50-50, mm-hmm. it shows to your co-founder you intend to do everything on equal terms, right? Yeah. If it's 51-49, then you're showing, you're signaling to your co-founder that when push comes to shove, uh, then you know who's the boss. Like mm-hmm. that's, I think it's the money is kind of secondary at that point. It's just setting the right the, the right relationship from mm-hmm. the start. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I also think like I, I think we should probably get into the the topic of USP, but uh, yeah. yeah, I think we've we've. Got, it's true, uh, true. I think we've, we're, we're now founder to founder having some yeah. having a heart to heart. You yeah, guys yeah. can listen in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, sorry guys, like this conversation is slightly going sideways in terms of the core topic, but hopefully just give us a thumbs up or something if you're still enjoying the conversation or if you want us to, uh, you know, move out to the USP topic specifically hardcore. I'm happy to do that. And steal hey, I, yeah. I see Manas said he was, he was top on the India quiz leaderboard in quiz up. So yeah. thanks Manas. Yeah. Yep. I never spent any money on it though. Sorry. 
<laughs> well, nobody did, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> well, as long as the team has a couple of Michelin star uh, chefs, that's all right. <laughs> they can afford it. All right. Did we make any money today? <laughs> no. While while I eat my sushi. All right. Awesome. Sushi says no. <laughs> Right, cool. So I think on the USB, I got one thumbs up. Uh, I'll say that the others want us to talk more about USBs as well. So uh, let's you know. go. Um, so generally, how do you think about like you know like is there a, so typically just for the context of everybody as well, right? When we think about USBs, right, in the tech ecosystem, uh, if you're looking to start a technical product or uh, start a startup building some product, etc., right? Like the first thing that anybody asks is like, what's your USB, right? Like what's what's unique about your product that is um, not available in the market, right? So do you think this applies to even gaming companies broadly uh, from a first a product lens perspective? Then we can talk about other alternatives as well. Mm. I think uh, the, the key word is unique. Mm. Um, and another, another way people approach the same question is by asking you what your motives. Mm. So as a gaming company, how do you, like what stops somebody else from copying exactly what you're doing today? And, take all of the success. Hmm. Um, and I think like, in that sense, gaming is like fashion. Like you have, you see some, uh, I, I don't know, in Paris Fashion Week, you see something walking down the runway and everyone loves it. And then you get a $10 version coming out in Primark um, hmm. uh, just a couple of weeks later. It's like fast fashion. Um, gaming is, this, is somewhat the same. If you have a game that is doing well, then now you've got mostly 10 copies that will come out quickly. If you think about Wordle, Wordle was a phenomenon earlier this year. And how many clones of Wordle are out now? What was the USP of Wordle? What was the moat? Yeah. I mean, the game, so just to break that down, like the game itself had a USP. It was a take on Mastermind and uh, another game called Lingo and mm. uh, ha had this unique combination of each of them. Now, that made the game sort of special in its own way. And, uh, it, and also I, I believe like the sharing part was quite an innovation as well. Like the way you could share a cryptic grid, which told, mm. told everyone a story. Um, yeah, so that, that was fine as a USP for your game. And that got it to, you know, that, that got it to garner like a lot of attention and, and VAU. Um, but it never really had a moat. If you think about it, nobody, like, why would people play this versus something else um, versus an exact copy? And I think that a lot of that audience was cannibalized. But mm. I think there's something to remember here that IP is a moat. IP is a USP. <laughs> mm. So if you are first into a category and you are the biggest in that category, everyone will remember your name versus anyone else. I know it's soft. It's not like you have a moat as in, I don't know, I have retail partnerships and those retail partnerships can't go to anyone else because we have contracts. But if you have an IP, um, that, you know, nobody can copy that IP, even if they try uh, to make some sort of si similar sounding sort of knockoff, they'll never be the same as Wordle, mm -hmm. right? Everyone mm -hmm. remembers the name Wordle. They don't remember Wordly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think being first and establishing a brand is something you really need to think about as a, as a business. And I think when we were raising money, I really had to sort of educate, you know, uh, VCs in this way, like, you know, being first, having a brand yeah. um, it is, is really important. I think um, another one is uh, community. So it's very important to build communities around your games. Those are your core players who will keep coming back. And that's very hard to do. And I think um, it's a little bit more effort than, <laughs> than just like liking our Facebook page or something, because that's not really a community. That's just liking a page and you can't really, it's not a forum. You can't chat with anyone. Um, yeah. it's, it's just like subscribe to our newsletter. That doesn't mean I'm part of the community. Yeah. Um, so really that's where these solutions like Discord uh, come into the picture. I don't know why every game doesn't have a Discord button. Like, yeah. if, if, if um, in the case of Bombay Play, we have community buttons, so you can join a community and uh, which is like a forum. And you know, we find that people who engage with that community sort of retain a lot more and far mm -hmm. more unlikely to move to other games. 
yeah i guess so uh, retention yeah. overall in the long run right yeah retention and that's not something that it can easily be broken like clash yeah. of clans has a really strong community yeah um, and, and you know they kind of have years exactly like they they have communities inbuilt to their app itself i mean of course you can use the third party solutions which you know is a great shortcut a great hack for new developers <laughs> um but yeah like that's why all these clash of clones apps never never really broke it <laughs> but like how do you think about like even in um this example right wordle right mm. yes there were overnight tens of hundreds of knockoffs that nobody remembers right but then yeah. also wordle also lots of appeal right i mean look at anything that rose to popularity pretty much out of nowhere right um all the way going back to even like flappy bird days right among us flappy bird servers are melting shit everywhere right but this usually it's like for weeks and after that it's gone right mm. so so how do you think about if somebody is in that position where they do get that uh you know something to completely knocked out of the park right how do you how do you sort of think about where to go from there right because yes you know they're going to be ample clones yes you know they're going to be probably 1% of the entire audience base that played your game who are going to be your die hard fans right how do you uh, like beyond just having your discord server and having a community moderator or showing up in the chat etc right like like what do you do next from there as a studio or as a founder like how do you what do you can potentially do next to leverage what you already got mm-hmm. like i think it's for first if you reach that level of virality where people who don't typically play the kind of game that uh you have made are playing then mm-hmm. you know that's not sustainable right they're going to lose interest pretty quick i mean some of them may convert but majority will not they're playing because everyone else is playing mm-hmm. right um and in game development especially free to play um sure like it's easy to and actually there's a quite a debate around this should you focus on uh should you focus on the top of the funnel because any effect you have on day one retention you know of your users hmm. has this trickle down effect which sort of you know the all the way down to like day 30 plus yeah um which isn't very easily achievable if you were trying to sort of uh affect day 30 retention by itself right so some some game developers will always focus on the top of the funnel and widening that as as much as they can but i think the smart developers are rather and i think the analogy here is um like a bowling ball alley like uh you can like i think the smart developers are just looking for the strike at the end of the alley mm. uh rather than sort of the journey the ball takes mm. so uh, i think like the the studios like supercell will only optimize for those day 30 players mm. because if they become your true fans mm. and they stick around well after 30 days if they stick around forever then you have a you know a sustainable business these mm-hmm. focusing on on the people who uh, sort of come and go on day one isn't really going to give you any sort of meaningful result uh in terms of revenue yeah 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 i think um, uh, only 30 days down the line maybe <laughs> got it yeah i i think this is related to the <laughs> the very first thing that i mentioned right like nailing down the persona right i think mm-hmm. if you know that okay there is this persona of my customer base okay middle east uh middle eastern countries women aged between 35 to 45 who are working in the it sector have a little bit of extra spending capacity and are more have modern in their relationships right? <laughs> okay okay, okay <laughs> yeah. not that far <laughs> so really no, like, it, it, it should go that far though like it really yeah. i'd say like in our moonfrog games it was mm. really only a collection of 100 or so people at mm. the end of it after millions of the au there was only this every well, per day overall it was bigger but per day it was like maybe 100 200 people who would actually convert and become mm. like your your payers paying customers so so you really have to uh, just instead of broadly categorizing in age groups and genders and locations you should really just look at those true fans and build for them So if you think about it like free to play is just this 
way of acquiring as many users as possible. But at the end of the day, each one of these games is trying to appeal to a very niche user base that converts. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. literally a couple of days back, I was giving an example on a student conversation that if you have to start a Rummy company today, in India, you'd be like the 500th Rummy company that exists. But what if you figure out that there is a subset of Indian audience that lives in Japan and there is no Japanese modified version of Rummy that's Let's serving go. their use case. Let's hit it. Now you have that use case to say, all right, this is my persona and this is where this audience lives. This is what they said spending capacity is and I can make a fundamental business around it as well, right? While mm-hmm. if you just try to do it in India, you'll be lost in a sweet in a sea of other drum media. Yeah, I mean, the way I would approach that is just build build your game and yeah, have that user in mind from day one. There's the one person who will like this game the most and try and understand them as deep as possible and uh, build that game perfectly for that one person. But you may, when you launch your game, you may find your audiences elsewhere. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and yeah. you should be sort of constantly experimenting uh, with acquisition to see uh, where your true fans are. Hmm. And then once you found them, then that's when you double down. Got it. Got it. So, uh, like, uh, go, just circling back on the talent point that you mentioned earlier, right? Like, okay, there's ample talent in Bangalore around, uh, you know, real money games, around uh, uh, free to play games, etc. Right? Like, so how are you thinking about the talent density given the the remote scenario? I, I think my assumption is that you're not big on the remote pattern. Or at least no, not no, we are, we are. We're totally, we're huge on it. We're fully mm. hybrid and hybrid forever. Mm. So, so, so what is hybrid? Because everybody's definition would change, right? So elaborate a little bit. Oh yeah, because some people say hybrid is like three days in the office. We're exactly. hybrid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, for us, hybrid means work from anywhere forever. Yeah. Mm. Um, and we will have an office that you can come to if you want. Got it, got it. Uh, so it's sometimes more opt-in, right? Yeah, it's opt-in. Like we're, we're not going to force people to come to Bangalore and some people will never come. Hmm. Um, in fact, a lot of the companies that have called their, called their employees back, we get a lot of job applications like, from these places. Uh, so Same. I think people have really, really appreciated the flexibility. And um, honestly, like we find hybrid is, well, working remote in general is great for execution because you start your day, you give everyone their tasks and the rest of the day is sort of just focus, focus, focus. Mm. And then, you know, at the end of the day, you give your updates and that's it. Like, so long as you have a good process, the work will happen. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't, I think for gaming, the problem is creativity. Um, but I think that's a solvable problem. Um, we, that's why in Bombay Play, we run all these game jams. Hmm. Um, and so the, when you make the objective innovation, then people can just focus on that. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rather, I think people, it's, it's a bit of a crutch to lean on when like, oh, innovation will happen organically if we're just sitting in the same office hmm. um, the, versus having a process around like, hey, this is the time that we're setting aside to try some crazy stuff. Yeah. So are you like, I, I just want to learn a little bit more about this game gap concept internally. I talked to Abbas last time and we touched right. on it briefly, but like, how are you structuring these? Because this is something that is on the cards for Outscale as well to figure out how yeah, to yeah, run yeah. game jams. Uh, but sure. for obviously not just within Outscale team, but like for the broader community. Um, so cool. there's something- Bombay Play will sponsor it. One like yeah. prize money. I'm saying it now. <laughs> We'll, we'll, talk, it out there. we'll talk about it. I think you <laughs> told says me. It's done. <laughs> no, no, I think you told right, me about it. He's drafted this, a mail. Right? He just mailed me. <laughs> All okay. right, perfect. So, but but anyhow, like, how are you structuring this innovation process, right? Like, just talk a little bit. Is there something that you guys iterated on and figured out this works, this doesn't work? Something that we yeah. can learn from. Like, no, no game jam is the same. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, we keep on, I think the first game jam we did was super open. Uh, and it was like, do what you want. What's the worst no, nobody happen? did shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 everyone did stuff. It was just wasn't like, they did stuff that wasn't exactly in line with what well, the our strategy at the time, mm. I think. So next time we said, look, uh, okay, here are the, uh, we tried to get it a bit more focused. Like here are the sort of, this is the theme of the game jam and we want to build around this theme. 
uh, that was working slightly better. Um, we also experimented with time as well. Like, oh, what if we try and do a game jam in three days? What if we dedicate an entire week and just like jam all week? Um, and some, I think the most recent one we did was more of a pitch fest, which mm. was like, okay, like before we were doing hackathons, but now let's see what, when we ask everybody to make a pitch, what will they pitch? Mm. And uh, we, we went for volume of pitches. It was like first day you pitch 10 games. <laughs> um, each well, person? Yeah, 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 no, it was each team 10 each games team. kind of okay, thing. Okay, okay, okay. Um, well, max 10, that was the cap. It wasn't like up to 10, you can pitch. Just <laughs> minimum, sure 10. <laughs> yeah, no, no, minimum, minimum 10. 100 is the max, is the cap. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah uh, so people just put together like their best ideas one slide is you know like elevator pitch style mm. like mm. next idea next idea next idea mm. um and and um we uh yeah we just iterated um but we uh, that allowed us to really focus on like oh this uh, this idea seems to have potential we may now go ahead and prototype that mm. so it. that was our format like start with the elevator pitch yeah then go with the then do the hackathon you know Got it. Um, Got it. so that kind of worked well for us i think next time we'll do a blend of hmm. uh, a blend of both but of are them. you involving even like non-technical teams as well uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like every process. everybody can jump in hmm. um but you know also people can opt out like <laughs> i think <laughs> I think some people really don't like it. Like, yeah, 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 <laughs> say, yeah. I have to pitch games. <laughs> no, I, I'm a finance executive. <laughs> no, no, that's, 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 that's no, literally why I asked, right? That's literally why I asked, right? Like, are you making optional or mandatory for everybody? Because people who don't come from a pure play gaming background are still part of the company, right? And mm-hmm. and for them it would be like what the fuck is this shit right like why am I doing this <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah. yeah I think uh, people from non gaming backgrounds do find it quite quite weird it's like mm. this is my job <laughs> <laughs> you're telling me to just yeah make just shit make up? stuff <laughs> yeah yes uh, yes sorry, uh, uh, but but it's been successful sorry because like from yeah. the last game jam I think there were like three games that actually. Uh, mm-hmm. went into production and will be releasing soon. Okay. In fact, one of them has been released. Like one team made uh, mm-hmm. their own Wordle clone and we released that. And okay. that did really well for us. <laughs> you you <laughs> rip-offs. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, you can blame the Game Jam team who dedicated the... <laughs> No, I blame the CEO. No, authorized okay. you, no you can blame the CEO. You can yeah. blame the CEO. Who, who encouraged the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was just asking, yeah. right, is there any news related to the game chat that the team plays and hosts out? But it's, I think it's internal, right? Like nothing of the stuff that you really get shared externally in any public forum. No, no, because really it's, that's, uh, you could call it our USP is uh, to be this innovation factory. Mm. 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 Got it. Yeah. Uh, for just a caveat here, okay. like how yeah, you if we open about- source. Yeah, if we open source all of our ideas, then I don't know what's left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So we're doing. So my sort of, you know, caveat on this is just that, like, when I think about game jams at Outscape, right, like, uh, uh, the way I think about this is sort of like, you know, enabling creativity at scale, right? Like, how do we get, you know, thousands and thousands of community members participating in game jams around themes and really coming up with creative ideas, right? So how you're thinking about within the team at Bombay Play, eh, like I'm thinking about from uh, the community lens within Outscape, right? Like similar thought process, but like you said, right, every game jam will be different and here the context is very different. So um, the execution might end up being very different as well. So yeah, Uh, but awesome. So um i think uh we're just hitting up on the time limit and we want to keep you hold up for long i know you're busy as well so thanks again yeah. for coming in i think this was a blast at least personally for me um sorry for folks who i took oliver on a distraction route for the last week <laughs> uh, we'll have that later don't worry yeah founder to founder conversation but yeah thanks yeah. again oliver for coming in um, you can cry on my shoulder on <laughs> yours yeah. it'll be great yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Next time we are in Bangalore. So awesome. Thanks for coming in and, and would love to host you sometime soon as well. Uh, we'll stay in touch and you know, uh, 
uh, take care and and thanks, anything Manos. that thanks, you know Sai. we can thanks, share Sai. with the with the community members regarding games to check out for Bombay Play, let us know. Uh, I'll drop a shout out as well. Hey, absolutely, we have a lot of um, a lot of games in play testing at the moment. Uh-huh. Um, so we'd we'd love to get more play testers in and. Yeah, if you want yeah, us, yeah. we can figure out some way to coordinate even dedicated sessions to get uh, somebody from your team to mm-hmm. conduct that in the outscale Discord server as well. Now we have like close to, we're just about to touch 7K members in Discord. Whoa, uh, okay. So, uh, so we should be... So we just put, a, like our games, are, most of our games are on H5, so we can just okay. drop a link and you can just play. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But I think uh, if having feedback. having somebody from your team there to collect feedback and figure out mm-hmm. what's breaking and all, um, that might be also helpful as well. So mm-hmm. so yeah, we can take this offline, but uh, happy to cool. coordinate some some of these efforts as well. Awesome. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for joining in, and you know we'll see you guys uh, soon as well. All right, thanks Oliver. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye guys.